right now, I'd like to introduce Mr. Dan. You want to come afterwards, though? Is that correct? Uh, okay. Well, we're excited. We have Gideons here. I love Gideons Ministry, Gideons International. They're the ones that give um, Bibles, free New Testaments, etc. out to folks. And in the, host, in the different hotels, you'll see a Bible often. They're from Gideons, and they do a lot of different other kinds of ministries. Um, I know you want to show a video right now, and then you want to culminate. Is how you want to do it, Mr. Dan? Okay, great. So we're going to go ahead and show the video, and then Mr. Dan will come right up and, and share. Thank you, sir. As the night fell, I was spotted by two men that I had robbed. They dragged me out of the car and they beat me. I opened up my door and on my front doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents and I was charged with a street value equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. I was a habitual felon, meaning that I had been in prison several times. I had several, multiple felons that I had been prosecuted for. I had been told by my attorney that, um, that all hope was, was gone. And one Saturday morning, uh, a brave soldier came through, uh, probably one of the bravest men that I've ever met. In his hand, he had a little brown book. He said, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? He opened it to the back pages and shared with me the plan of salvation. He told me that the Lord loved me and he could forgive me of all my sin. I took that New Testament back to my cell and for the very first time, I opened up that New Testament and I read through the entire Gospel of Mark. I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And he gave me that little book and told me to take it with me. Told me to put my name on the back of it if I believed it. And uh, he turned and walked away. Gideons are men of your church, doing what they've been called to do. These are your testimonies. The Gideon Ministry expands your opportunities for evangelism in your community and beyond. When you participate in the Gideon Ministry through prayer, financial gifts, and membership to dramatically expand the reach of your church. In fact, over the 100 plus years of the Gideon ministry, you've enabled us to give away almost two billion copies of scripture. Please join hands with us as together we become God's love in action, placing his word across the street and around the world. I don't know where all the millions of scripture has gone, but I know where one scripture has gone. And it landed in my hands. Because of you and the purpose and the plan of the Gideons, my whole life has changed. And it was that scripture that began the journey for me toward a life of obedience to Christ. Because it is the word of God that transforms lives. Good morning. I'm Dan Baker from the Gideons. Thanks for letting me be here. Um, anybody seen one of these before? Me too. 1975, when I was a senior in high school. I'm only, I'm here because of this. My boss gave me one of these and he said, this is truth. You're going to need this. And he showed me the plan of salvation in the back. And I wasn't ready at the time, but three years later, 1978, I gave my heart to the Lord. And I am so thankful for the Gideon ministry. And I'm thankful for the church that supports them. Two billion. I know, like the video says, where one of these ended up in my heart. Praise God. Uh, I'm really here to ask you to do three things for us. First is... Pray for us. Pray for the ministry. Second, you can contribute, as this church has done faithfully for years and years, and we're thankful for that. But most importantly for today is join us. If God has put on your heart a call to evangelism, this is one of the best ways to do that. Those videos of going into the prison and to the schools, to the first responder locations, to the armed forces, the Gideons will deliver this wherever we can worldwide. And we need your help. Brothers, if the Holy Spirit is putting on your heart a call to follow the Great Commission, then I ask you to join us. 
thank you for your time. I love the ministry of Gideons. Um, When I was uh, um, at seminary, we had a man from Gideon speak and sharing the different things of what they were doing and how they, and this was in Washington State, which, you know, tends to be more resistant. And, uh, but they were still out there on the sidewalks in front of schools, passing out New Testaments to school. Kids were coming out and and, uh, challenging. Remember the challenge? It's like, why hold back? What's holding you back? You know, we got to get the word out. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much, Dan. I love the beginning of his ministry. Thank you. Um, matter of fact, I'd like to pray for him right now. Can we do that? Father God, I want to thank you so much for the Gideon's ministry. I want to thank you so much for uh, Dan coming and sharing on behalf of that ministry. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done in that ministry. And continue. We pray your blessing on it. So, it, it, Lord, there's never been a time of our need, a greater, greater need than right now. And uh, getting your word out, getting the gospel out than now. We pray your church arise up. We pray we would join hands, Lord, and join arms, arms to arms with wonderful ministries like Gideon. So we would, all, your local church would be out there getting the word out. Together we would be fervently communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we know the time. This is the time. And Lord, I pray your blessing on it. Lord, any way we can support as a church and individuals, Gideons, but in, in like-minded ministries, we thank you for them. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, sir. All righty. Um, I want to take this moment right now, and if I can, I would like to have the kids stand up, and I want to pray for them. <laughs> it's so good to see you, Karina. <laughs> And Xavier, there is. Okay, good. Let, let's pray for him. Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, for our kids. Lord, pray your blessing on them. May they have a great time learning about Jesus today, Lord, and learning more about the gospel and learning more about prayer, Lord, in, in their own lives. Bless them, Lord, as they, as they see the value that you hear their prayers and how important they are to you. Just, Lord, to help them just to cherish the fact that they can com- communicate with you. We thank you, God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great time. That away. Awesome. And the rest of us, adult types, if we can all stand, and we're going to be, uh, if you would, we're going to pray, and then I'm going to read from God's Word, if you remain standing as we read from God's Word. Father God, we want to thank you for this opportunity, Lord, as we get into your Word. We want to hear you today. Lord, you have a message for us today. Help us to hear it, and help us to get it. Speak to us. Do something in our hearts and our minds and our spirits so that we are positively and permanently changed. Help us to get it, Lord. It's important. Lord, help us to be changed because we came today. We thank you, God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Jesus is praying to his Father. He says, Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you. You may be seated. I started a series a couple weeks back on the Lord's Prayer, uh, where the series is um, called um, Following the Ideal Pattern for Prayer. A couple weeks back, we talked about the importance of the packaging of prayer. And how most people don't even talk about that, but Jesus talked about how we approach God in prayer before before he told us how to pray. He told us uh, the conditions or the attitudes and, and the perspective and the, uh, the, the manner in which we should pray. That's the packaging. That leads before Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. That's the earlier part of Matthew 6. And then that leads, he used that to lead right into the Lord's Prayer, which we're now looking at. We're kind of unpacking it verse by verse uh, for the next few weeks. We looked at verse 9 last week about the importance uh, when he says, Father, hallowed be your name. We talked about the importance that Jesus was making a declaration there about Father, may May your name be held holy here on this earth. May you be, may, may we, your people, your people, Lord, honor you and respect you, revere you. When you res, we talked about when you respect God's name, we're actually respecting him because it's an extension of himself. Today I want to talk about the importance of 
God's kingdom, praying about God's kingdom coming, his will being done here on earth. And what that means, what that's going to look like. We're going to be talking about, um, well, the importance of just hmm, praying for God's will to be done when it seems like the world is resistant in his ways. How do we pray for that? And we're going to be looking at Elijah today because he faced a similar situation that we face, face today. And we're going to look at how he handled it, how, uh, how he had challenges in his circumstances, but ultimately God gave him victory in those circumstances. And how we follow his pattern, we can do the same, experience the same. There's a neat Christian man named Daniel Cormier, and he uh, was talking about a time when he, is, he, he and his wife, they had three little, at the time anyway, three young daughters, and they were, you know, gathered around the dinner table, and their five-year-old daughter named Rachel asked to pray, and they said, sure, of course, and you go ahead and pray, and, and so she prayed this very quick prayer. She said, uh, thank you for this food, amen. <laughs> that was it. And they started laughing. They were like, what? what? Well, she said, why are you laughing? Because she was the one that would always pray for, please bless mommy and daddy and auntie, and all, and all and on and on and on. And this time she just said, thank you for the food, amen. And, and she said, I'm hungry. You know, they said, and then they're still laughing. He said, hey, God liked my prayer. And they said, oh, that's, that's true, Rachel. That's true. God liked your prayer. Well, she had a little sister named uh, Anna who was only three years old. And Anna says, well, yeah, uh, only God liked your prayer. <laughs> uh, anyways, they all started laughing about that. When we talk today about the importance of prayer and the relevance of praying for our society, when it seems our society and our world has gotten further and further away from him. How do we do with that? I'm, I'm going to get deep today a bit. We all see it. If we're honest about it. We all see it. Right? We see how challenging it is. We see how a world seems to be getting further and further away from our God. And yet Jesus said, Father, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, that's a dramatic prayer when we really understand what he's talking about there. How do you pray for God to change this world and change our country and to change our society for, according to his will? When you see, it seems like, when you say, Lord, please help our world draw closer to you and it seems like it's getting further away. Do you, do you feel overwhelmed by that? When you want to pray to God, you ask the Lord, Lord, please bring about revival. Pray our society, our country needs you more than it's never needed you before. And it seems like less people are even open to hearing the gospel or the truth of it. There is so much. Let's just be honest. The condition of our society and our world is just getting worse. Frankly, it is. I'm being blunt about it. It's a fact. See a growing, growing tide of secularism? Resistance to God and His principles? It's true. It's reality. If you're honest with it, you see it. And there's even a growing resistance against God himself. This last week, I saw so many things as did you. I saw for the herd, for the first time, people who were fighting to still resist abortion. I heard the phrase, they are, they, the f person that was a pundit on TV, and they called them Christo-fascists. Meaning if a Christian, people who follow Christ are fascists if they are against abortion. How does that make you feel? How do you deal with that? I'm not, there's a million different things I could share. Gallup poll, I won't go into it. Maybe I'll just have it forwarded and, and have Bob put it on the blog. Uh, a church's website. By the way, check out our church website. Bob, you're doing a phenomenal job. Thank you for that. Gallup just came out with a poll this week. They just showed, every, they've been doing the same poll every single year. 
since 2001 about, and it's based on asking Americans throughout the country, all walks of life, age, you know, whatever, race, whatever, belief system, party system, etc. What do you think? And they use the phrase, do you consider the, how many of you consider this to be morally acceptable? That was always, is this morally acceptable? Is this morally acceptable? For the first time in the history of our country, 52% of our country now believes abortion is morally acceptable. Never, that was, that's never been above 50% before. That's just one example. There's many different things. and they were, They're all increased. And that was their point. The tendency of our country is towards, per, they use the phrase permissiveism. The Bible would just say towards unrighteousness. But it was prophesied, wasn't it, that this would happen? Wasn't it? Second yeah. Timothy chapter 3. I, I, I was been looking through Second Timothy for this week. I've just been focusing it over, over, and over, and over again. Especially the second half of Second Timothy. 3 and 4, all is about the last days. I'm just going to look at two verses because it hit me. The second verse is what really hit me this week. Let me, let's read Second Timothy 3, 1 and 3. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. Verse 3. They, talking about the people who, of, this, of these last times, will be unloving and unforgiving. They'll slander others and have no self-control. They'll be cruel and hate what is good. I tell you what, growing up, it seemed like I, when I was a child, and this is not my, I have to be really worried when I do this, I get off, and, but it, I'm just, when I was a child, I was, this shows you how ignorant I was. I was raised in church. So I, I thought everybody who was American was a Christian. That was my perspective. I didn't understand. Her later on, when going into junior high, that wasn't the case. Oh, Really? Because everyone seemed moral to me. And yet, what has happened in our lifetime? The view of values of morality and immorality have flipped. That last phrase when it says they'll be cruel and hate what is good. You know what immediately I thought about? I thought of cancel culture. That's what hit me. The, the view that if you don't believe or ascribe to a particular narrative or dogma, you don't, you deserve, you need to be, deserve to be canceled, you deserve to be heard, you need to be, you're taken off, banned from social media or whatever it might be, any kind of platform, any kind of speech, and you, you are, you deserve to not be heard, you deserve to be ostracized. In reality, you really don't deserve to be here. And in truth, more and more, as you know, The phrase is going more and more level right at Christianity, Christians, because they see us as still maintaining the morality of Jesus Christ's word, as we should do. How do you confront such unloving, hate-filled rhetoric and perspectives in a Christ-like way? Do you just silently pray for the people, hoping, hope, hoping against hope that maybe God will change them? How do you pray for them then? Also, how do you confront your own fears in the situation? Are you afraid to even speak out because you might yourself be canceled? <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> For too many of us, that is the case. For years, I'm going to open up here for me, myself a little bit. For years, I period periodically wrestled with the concern that I might die someday for my faith. In other words, I was afraid. I dealt with not a real fear, but an uneasiness that I someday will die a martyr's death for my faith. And it was based on a, a couple of dreams, dramatic dreams, which I've shared before. Uh, some other time, if you want to hear it, I can share it in more detail. I'm not going to go into it right now. But I was 17. I was afraid that I wouldn't be faithful to the end. So I said a little prayer before I went to sleep. Lord, will you tell me if I'm going to be faithful to the end? I meant it sincerely. God honored that teenage heart, and he gave me a dream where I, died, where, where I dreamed that I was being dying for my faith in a dungeon kind of a situation. And I did die for my faith, and then I was being lifted up by God in, into heaven. And... 
if you didn't remember, if you didn't know, we had sustained, suspended my bed at the time. It was a hanging bed. And so God let me down at the end of the dream. And then as soon as he did, the bed broke. <clears throat> the ropes that held my bed broke at the end of the dream. And then he gave me the exact same. After I put the bed up two weeks later, he gave me the exact same dream again. At the end of that dream, the ropes of my bed broke again. Obviously, that made an impact on me. And I knew he was answering my prayer that, yeah, you're going to be faithful at the end, son. Which was cool. But then I started wondering over the years, was he also telling me how I was going to die? And then I started, I didn't want to fear that. I didn't want to fear that. But I just saw the world getting worse and worse and worse. 1990s, man. We started seeing it back then. Early 2000s. And I started, and I, and I, so I tried to put it on my mind. It's like, I don't want this fear. It's, I don't want fear of dying for Jesus. I want to be faithful to him. And I, and, and I, it wasn't a real fear. It was just an uneasiness. Like, I didn't have a peace about it. And that bothered me. No, I should be excited about it. I started wondering, will I really die for my faith? Now, listen, I couldn't get past this low grade uneasiness about it. Didn't want to fear dying for my faith. Now, I can't give you an actual explanation why, except for I knew what it would meant to die for my faith from a reality, because I think from those dreams and with how, it is, how it, the bed breaking, it was so obvious, and it was a total exact repeat dream. I mean, the whole thing was obviously God speaking to me that I didn't know. Now, let me tell you something. You might think, oh, I've heard people say, I, I, I talk to other Christian leaders, hey, how do you feel about maybe the potential of dying for your faith if our society gets worse? And, they, and the reaction is always, oh, I'd love that. I, whatever God wants, no problem. Hey, yeah, woohoo. I remember thinking, maybe, why don't I feel that way? I mean, I want to feel that way. Why don't I feel that way? And I, and I think the reason why is because it was real, real, really real for me. Because that dream, those dreams are very, very real. I, they were real and repeated. And the bed broke twice. How many times do you had your bed break? from a dream so it was reality for me now listen let me tell you something for a lot of people they think oh it's no big deal of course I'd love it I, yeah I'd taken this spiritual gift test and I came out high in martyrdom wow that's awesome but you know, let me tell you something the disciples thought that they were no, they wouldn't fear dying for Jesus either didn't they the night he was betrayed Oh, Lord, I would never deny you. Within a few hours, every one of them abandoned him when he was arrested. And Peter denied him three times that very night when he had just said earlier, Oh, Lord, I'd never de deny you. And he meant it sincerely. He didn't think he would. Don't take it lightly. And it's more real for me, maybe. And I wanted to be a person who, no matter what, Lord, I don't want to give in to any kind of fear, uneasiness. I want to go whatever it takes. Now let me ask you, you ever wrestle with the feelings about being strong in a world that seems like it's going so much against you? You ever wrestle as a believer, as a Christian, a true Christ follower, that you want to be strong no matter what, when you see when so many people to belittle now the way you believe, if you truly believe this? How does it make you feel? How do you, how do you plan to fight an uphill battle for righteousness? Do you want to be a Christian incognito? I'll pray about it. Shh, behind enemy lies. Foxhole. How do you do it boldly? Dealing with these feelings, you're fight, if you're facing them, those feelings, it's, I like to call it the Elijah syndrome. Because it's the very thing that Elijah fought. He had a situation his, in his, that he was fighting in the Old Testament very much like we're dealing with today. In many ways, it was worse. Elijah was one of the most well-known prophets in the Old Testament. God did phenomenal things to that man. But he was, in a, he was a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel when they had totally abandoned God. 
And they had the worst king at the time. Probably in the history of Israel. Ahab. And they had the worst queen ever, which misled Ahab. Queen Jezebel. And, and Elijah was the prophet during that time. And let me tell you, they hated Elijah. In fact, Queen Jezebel had already put a bounty on all the prophets of God's heads. To have them all killed. King Ahab had sent people, messengers, looking for Elijah through all the different countries around saying, do you have Elijah? And if you don't, better watch out. He hated Elijah that much. And God used Elijah. And God used Elijah to pray for God, for God to stop the rain from coming down. To cause a famine and to cause a drought so that maybe the people will be open to going back to God. And so Elijah prayed that. Sure enough, for three and a half years, it didn't rain. And toward the end of that particular period of three and a half years, then God used Elijah for the great prophet preach out. You know, the contest. You know about that one? Where, God, where Elijah, by you know being led by God, said, Ahab! You call all the prophets of Baal and all the prophets of Astra together. I'm going to challenge all of you and all of Israel. Get on Mount Carmel. I want you to check this out. So they did. And then Elijah said, hey, you know what? Quit wavering between God or Baal. In fact, it was mostly just Baal by that point. He said, okay, let's have this great, this great challenge. Baal versus God. Two altars. One altar for Baal. One altar for God. We'll put a bowl on offering on both of them. And then we'll just leave it. Don't set it on fire. Then we'll pray. And if Baal sends it on fire from hell, from heaven, they thought, or whatever, down there, we would say hell. Anyways, then okay, Baal's the guy. But if it's God sends it fire, then God's the one we worship. Everyone said, that's cool. You know the story? That's an awesome story. Elijah said, you guys go first. There's so many of you. Okay. So they did. Did their offering up there. Started praying to their bail. Started going around. 850 of these guys. <sighs> praying. Nothing happening. Midway, mid-morning. Starts taunting them. Maybe he's hard to hear and yell, yell louder. You know, those kinds of things. Let me go, and by noontime, well, maybe he's in the bathroom. He can't hear and yell louder. You know, that kind of stuff. So they start gashing themselves, dancing and chanting. Maybe he's on vacation. You better really yell really loud. They do. All the way till the evening. Finally, Elijah says, okay, that's it. God's son. Calls all the people there. He had to restore the altar of God because they had destroyed it. And then he put on a bowl there and he, the wood and everything else. And, and even had him pour out. Four large jars of water, three times over, just saturated the whole thing. And even filled up this trench around the altar with water. And he said, okay. One simple prayer. Walks over to the altar and he says, God, your reputation's on the line. You better do this thing. Lonnie translation. <laughs> Fire. <laughs> Let's read that. Let's read that together. It's 1 Kings 18, 38 and 39. Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down. From heaven and burned up the young bull, the, the wood, the stone, and the dust. It even licked up the wall, the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, Yahweh, He is God. Yes, the Lord, He is God. Okay, major point. Then Elijah said, Okay, those false prophets have been misleading you guys, worshiping the wrong guy, get them. And they did. They put them all to death just right there for misleading the people of Israel. And then Elijah wasn't done even then. He said, okay, Ahab, get, start partying a little bit, get feasting up because guess what? I'm going to pray and there's going to be rain now because the people turned to God. Cool. So Elijah went to pray. Seven times he prayed, you know, for God to bring down, down rain. And sure enough, they came, big torrential rain. <laughs> End of drought, end of famine. God was giving Elijah victory after victory after victory after victory. And then Ahab went back to the palace and told Queen Jezebel what happened. And, and everything 
turned around for Elijah in his mind. She sent word, if you're alive in 24 hours, it ain't going to happen. You're going to be dead. You know what that man of God did? He ran. And 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 he ran. Down to Beersheba. Left his servant. Praise a prayer. Lord, kill me now. I'm not any better than my ancestors. God, give him an angel to restore him. Give him some strength. And he kept running further and further and further. Finally, got off. he made it to Mount Sinai. And when he finally got to Mount Sinai, God spoke to him twice. And it basically said, Elijah, I don't remember putting like, traveling to Mount Sinai on your itinerary. Why are you over here? And both times, Elijah responded to God the same way. He said this. This is found in 1 Kings, verse 19 and 10. Chapter 19, verse 10. Elijah replied, I've zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. God didn't accept that response. And so he asked him after giving him a show of his force, basically, he asked him again why he was there and Elijah responded the same way. And then God responded by saying, didn't even respond to Elijah's statement. He simply said, no, you're going to go back into the fight in fact, I'm going to have you anoint a new king of Syria and a new king of Israel. It's going to be Jehu. In fact, I'm going to have you anoint Elisha so that he's going to be a future prophet when I call you home. Oh, and then I have more response for, for uh, more calls for you to do as well after that. Oh, and by the way, 1 Kings 19 verse 18, yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who've never bound to Baal or kissed him. In other words, Elijah, I understand how you feel overwhelmed. I know how, how the society feels like, you feel like everyone's turned away from me. How you feel like you're all alone and, and, like, and like you feel like you're going up against an uphill battle. But you're not alone. I have preserved a remnant for myself. 7,000 faithful warriors. Sometimes I feel all alone. You're in your workplace and you feel like you're the only one there worshiping God anymore or believing his ways or his purposes. You're in your neighborhood and you see the same thing. You look around and you see in your own family and you go, man, why do my kids, my grandkids don't even seem to have a reverence for God? You feel, you feel like you're dealing with the Elijah syndrome. Like you're all alone. How do you handle that? Well, listen. We do what Elijah did in some respects. We see how tough it is. We come to our we come to our church. And we pray for God to bring more folks to him. Lord, where are they? Let me tell you something. Elijah felt like ending it there when he ran. He had a weak moment. But he did the right thing in some respects. He shouldn't have run from the battle. That's what he was wrong in. But he was right in where he ran to. He was wrong that he ran from the battle. But he was right in who he ran to. Because he ran to God. That's why he went to Mount Sinai. It was known to be the mountain of God. And listen, when you feel like you're overwhelmed, when you feel like you can't go on, when you feel like, you're, like you don't have the strength to stand for God, when you feel like you're the minority and you can't handle it, you don't know what to do, you do what Elijah did, you can stand with temerity 
When you run to God in humility. By temerity, we mean by strength. We mean courage. We mean boldness. We mean you can have power. It means you can be tenacious about your faith. You can stand with temerity when you run to God in humility. That's what Elijah did. It was right. And the ancient neat thing about this, he, he was fighting a groanly hostile world, and we do the same. We see that. We see what's going on. And we say, well, it's prophesied. Second Timothy chapter 3, we're to read it. Maybe there's nothing we can do. No, it's not true. We can run to God in humility. We can stand in temerity in strength and power. But we, too often we feel overwhelmed that we don't always run to God, do we? We run to other things. We run from him. We run to our fun. We run to our things we get our mind out of. Our, 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 I don't know, TV or our internet or our hobbies or our work or whatever it might be. We run to other things, other people, but we don't run to him. It's only in him we get our temerity, we get our strength, we get our power. And here's the neat thing. Because Elijah did it right, eventually but they did go to God, God did strengthen him. He was able to stand in temerity. I mean, he had already been doing it all the way through. He was fighting up your battle his whole ministry. God used him, right, to do that great preach out. <laughs> the altar. God used him to bring down, bring down the rain. <laughs> through the prayer. I mean, God had been using him mightily. He stood in temerity. He had a weak moment. We all do. But the neat thing is that even in his weakness, he ran to God. So he's able to be strengthened again. I can stand in temerity when I run to God in humility. Now, let me tell you something. Here's the neat thing. Each of us can fix, explain, experience the same thing. You see, even Elijah did it right. Because even when he ran and had weakness, God strengthened him. He, went, he, went, he obeyed God and he went back into the fight. And we can experience the same thing. Here's a familiar passage we're aware of. It's a great one. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They'll soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Will God really cause that to happen in years of my life? Of course. He'll give us strength. Yes, he will. That happened with Elijah. After Elijah ran to God in humility, God strengthened him. He said, get back in the fight, Elijah. He did. He immediately went. The Bible talks about it. He immediately went and he anointed Elijah to become the next prophet. And Elijah became his, his assistant after that. Then he went over to, and, and he went to Hananel over in Syria. He said, you're the next king of Syria. And then he went over to Jehu, a general for Israel. He said, okay, you're the next king uh, of Israel. And then he fought, he faced Ahab face to face again. And let me tell you about that one. He, he had to pr pronounce a, a very, the most difficult challenge you would give, a prophecy you would give to a king who would have your head. And he did it. What had happened was Ahab, King Ahab, and Queen Jezebel had just done this plot uh, to acquire, illegally acquire this land, this vineyard next door, owned by a guy named Naboth. They plotted to have Naboth murdered so Ahab could have his vineyard and plant a, a garden, vegetable garden. Oh, that's very important to have someone murdered. But he did. And so right afterwards, Ahab's checking out his new illegally acquired land. And, he, and Elijah shows up. Ahab's response is, is that you? Did you find me, my enemy? Yep. And now you're going to hear the word of God. You're, because you've disobeyed God, you've misled, misled Israel, your whole line is going to be eliminated. You're going to die a terrible death and tells how. Queen Jezebel is going to die a terrible death tells how. And all the rest of you are going to be all, your whole lineage is going to be gone. And all of it eventually happened. In other words, Elijah again stood in temerity because he'd already run to God in humility. Folks, that's where we're at. That's where we're at. 
That's the very thing that Jesus asked us to pray. You wonder, does Jesus want us to even pray? Come on, listen, I want you to hear this for a second. Listen, so I've heard Christians say this. They say, well, why should we even pray for things to get better? We already read, like we just read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it's going to get worse, right? And eventually, yes, it will. Does that mean we stop praying to get better? No. In fact, Jesus modeled for us to pray for it to get better. That's what this is talking about today and, and, and the Lord's Prayer. Let's look at it again. When we face Elijah's syndrome, how do we do it? It's by running to God with humility, we pray for God's will to be done. Look at the verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 10. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Now, the kingdom comes ultimately will be consummated when Christ returns. But we can even pray for it to happen in incrementally now when people come to Christ. But that second part, let your will be done on earth as is, is done in heaven, that's what we're talking about right now. That's talking about, Lord, I want your people here on this earth to live like the people they live in heaven. I want those people on this earth to live in righteousness like they live in righteousness in heaven. Lord, I want people to do your will here like they do your will there. Lord, I want your principles to be upheld down here like they're being upheld there. Lord God, I want to pray against abortion because I know there's no abortion up there. I mean, all these kinds of things. Amen, folks. That's what Jesus is asking us to pray. We don't look at our sight around us. We look at him. I can stand with temerity when I run to God in humility. And that's what Jesus is modeling for us. That's what Jesus prayed. He knew it was going to get worse. He prophesied it was going to get worse. But he didn't stop him from saying we need to pray for God's will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. He asked us to pray that. Don't stop praying. Now, let me ask you another question. Well, is that way praying in futility then? Well, he's already said it's going to get worse. And at some point, it will get worse. But you know what I think? It's going to get worse and better at the same time. How can that happen? I don't know. He's God. Let him do it. Because more people need to come to him, folks. Every day. Thank you, Gideons. Every day we need to be out there sharing Jesus Christ. Amen? And we not, need not to be ashamed of the truth. We need not to say, you know what? I'm sorry. But I'm not sorry. Homosexuality is still a sin. It is. It is. Because God said it. It's still a sin to to have sex outside of marriage. It is. Because God said it is. So it is. Just because the world's changed doesn't mean his truth has changed. Or the truth has changed at all. It hasn't. How do we stay strong? When the world seems so overwhelming, I can stand in temerity when I run to him in humility. And by the way, the Bible promises if we stand, we got to pray, but we need to be like Elijah. He ran to God, but he ran out of the fight. That's the part where he did wrong. We need to pray to God, but we need to stay in the fight. We need strength to get back in the fight. And he promises he will help us if we do. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9. So let's not get tired of doing what's good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. That's a promise, folks, for you and me. Don't give up. How do we approach God in a way to get him to change our world? We ask him, and then we get in the fight, and we help him, like Elijah did. It begins running to him in humility. We humbly come before him and say, Lord, may your kingdom come and may your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Make your will done here, God. And then get out there and share it. I've been praying to the Lord. Lord, how do you want me to personally? You see, listen, brothers and sisters, one thing for me is just share that up here in front, up front. It's another thing to model it, which I want to do. Lord, why do you want me to model sharing Jesus in the most effective way? Our time is short. I want to stand in temerity. So I'm running to you right now in humility. That should be our prayer, every one of our prayers. I began this message by talking about, and I'm ending this right now, about how I dealt for a period of time, for a number of years, I wrestled with this recurring uneasiness a nagging fear in some respects, not a real bad fear, but 
least an uneasiness anyways, of having to be martyred for my faith because of the dreams I'd had. Have I overcome that fear? Only the Lord knows for certain, but I think I have. See, I, I, I don't look anymore at a more potential martyr type death as, as regret or dread. In fact, I almost look at it with anticipation. I wouldn't say yet excitement, though there is excitement in there, believe it or not, now. Why? Because I love Jesus so much. I want to be found faithful to him to the end. Doing his work to the end. I want to be faithful. I want to be sharing Jesus. Brother Dan shared that he was talking, he was open up to me earlier, we met a couple days ago, about Gideons and how there's, most of the guys are getting older now. He's concerned because they do a great work and they do an awesome work. We need younger men. We need younger people. We need all of us. Either it's with Gideons or another source, we need to be sharing our faith. If folks, if you feel, if God prompted you about Gideons, follow the prompt. Or what other way? We have KMS. We have Mission Northeast. There's lots of different ways. Do something. And when I was praying, I was saying, Lord, how come now? Now I've gotten to the place where I almost look in excitement about maybe dying for my faith. There's no regret. There's only anticipation. Because I've determined that Jesus is more important to me than anything else in this world. And he's the one that helps me stand. I can stand in temerity because I run to him in humility. I hope you can feel the same way. I'm going to say a quick one sentence thought and say a prayer now. I don't... If it is indeed the last of the last days, and I don't know if it is or isn't, but if it is, are we doing everything we wanted? Will we feel like when Christ returns that we did do everything we could for people to know him? I don't want to approach him or face him with any regret. Do you? Let's pray. Father God, we run to you right now in humility. We ask that your will would be done in this earth. Lord, we see our society and world and it has changed. We've been seeing it now for years, but it just seems like it's been a snowball. It's picked up pace in recent times. But we know that you're bigger than that. Lord, we can, like Elijah, we can face that same syndrome. We can, when we feel overwhelmed, we can run to you in humility and then get the strength that we need to get back into the fight. Lord, help us. We need to get back into the fight. Help us to stand with temerity. Strong. Bold. Courageous. Tenacious. Powerful. Because we stand or kneel before you humbly. Not on our own strength. I pray for every one of us here, God. Lord, we want to join Jesus in that holy prayer that your kingdom's coming. Let it come. And let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Make your will done here on earth as it is in heaven. And help us to be a part of it. Help us to love people enough to share Jesus. Even if they slap us in the face or mock us or malign us or belittle us, help us to dare to love them enough to share Jesus no matter what. 
Help us to stand strong about what's truly right and pure and holy because that's what you want. Help us, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to be like Elijah who stood strong, Lord, against all the prophets of Baal. And Lord, when he had weakness, he ran to you to find strength. And Lord God, and you gave it. And he was able to again face the king face to face to give him a terrible prophecy for his life. Because he didn't fear him, he feared you. And you helped him stand strong. Oh, God. Lord God. I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God Almighty, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God. I ask, Lord, that you would pour out, Lord God, as you poured out your fire on that sacrifice. We ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would pour out your fire again on your people, Lord, that we would be your holy sacrifice. Lord God, we ask in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that we again would catch the fire of the living God. Lord God, that we would stand in the gap for you. That we would not, Lord God, subside and become incognito Christians. Hiding. That we would dare, Lord God, to love enough to share the truth of Christ regardless of how it's received. Let your kingdom come. May your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We pray this and we thank you in Jesus' name.